Harmony of the Gospels, number 37, Daniel and the Messiah, by Rev. D. Earl Kripe, read by Eric J. Miller. Our commentary over the past several programs has been occasioned by St. Luke chapter 3, verse 32, which tells us that Jesus himself began to be about 30 years old. The importance of this varies with commentators and doctrinal persuasions. It is our understanding and belief that it is a very important matter to establish a point about which there is much confusion and controversy. It is not a small matter. It has much to do with how you understand the Gospels of St. Matthew, St. Mark, St. Luke, and St. John, and the earthly ministry of the incarnate God. We have brought forth biblical information that would tend to support the idea that Jesus was born on the Day of Atonement. We are now going to take up the matter of chapter 9, verses 24 through 27 of Daniel the prophet, where this issue is settled, in our view. When we are done with our comments of this passage, you will see why it is so important to get this matter correct. If you are satisfied beyond any doubt that you know what this prophetic passage means to us today, and you have no further interest in studying it, then what I will have to say will be of no use or benefit to you. But if you are one who has unsettled questions about it, and you want to go ahead in your knowledge of the prophetic scriptures, then you should listen carefully to what I have to say. Here, more than in most places, it is important for you to put preconceived notions aside and listen with an open mind. That is not advisable or even permissible in matters of dogma. We are not open to questions about the virgin birth, the incarnation, the crucifixion, the resurrection, the vicarious atonement, salvation by grace, and the second coming of Christ. These are settled issues, and re-examining them can only lead to confusion, doubt, and error. They are part of our belief structure in God and the Bible. They are absolutes. But in matters that are in doubt, the Orthodox Church, as indeed the biblical passage we read last time, encouraged study and independent thought. The traditions of men, Jesus said, can turn you from the truth. Something is not true because it is popular or that it has been long taught. In difficult matters, there is a tendency to rely upon what others have said without really having a personal persuasion about its authenticity. Clever men, whether properly or improperly motivated, can wrest the scriptures to make them say something they do not and to deny what they do say. Having arrived at a conclusion about an evasive matter hard to be understood, one's ego can get in the way and we can cling tenaciously to what we have taught in the past, never wanting to be shown as having been wrong, and never wanting to admit to having been wrong. This is a powerful intimidation, without doubt. Even so, we must never be found in that position. This was a prevalent condition in Jesus' day, and he addressed it head on. In St. Matthew, he told the Jews, Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Matthew chapter 15, verses 7 through 9. In St. Mark chapter 7, verse 9, it says, And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. And in St. Mark chapter 7, verse 13, he accused them of, quote, Making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, unquote. The point here is that this can happen and does happen commonly. Views held by religious men on the subject at hand are in the vanguard of those examples. Indeed, all truth comes by revelation from the scriptures, and none of it comes by reason, science, experiment, or experience. But the redeemed mind must study and think about what is written in order to arrive at a correct position on biblical truth. I will cite several scriptures that tell us this. In Acts chapter 17, verses 10 through 11, we read, 
And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who, coming thither, went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. In Titus, St. Paul told the young evangelist in chapter 1, verse 14, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. This verse has direct and specific application to our discussion of Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, it is written, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Here we see that correct teaching of the word of God depends on diligent study and not a reliance on traditions, or certainly not that alone. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. In this passage, a reliance upon and an understanding of the word of God can correct doctrine and reprove unsound doctrine. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 through 16, it says, And account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. In this passage by St. Peter, we learn that those who try to teach difficult passages of the Bible without a good personal understanding of it will wind up twisting it to fit the traditions of men. This will end up in the destruction of their Christian lives, insofar as a sound biblical foundation is concerned, as well as the lives of those who listen to and follow them. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 27, we read, But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. This passage is not saying that God has not ordained Bible teachers or that we do not need them. It is saying something quite different. It is saying that, by the Holy Ghost within us, the Christian has access to truth in the scriptures that was unknown by the prophets and the ancients, and that cannot be taught to us by any person relying solely on the talents received from Adam by natural birth and scholarly degrees addressing those talents and abilities. This is in keeping with the declarations of the apostles about the Old Testament writings and how they are to be correctly understood. In Ephesians, the apostle says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby, when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. Here, St. Paul says that the ministry of Christ, deliberately hidden by God in the Old Testament and not understood by the ancients, can only be known by the revelation of the New Testament apostles and prophets.
St. Peter agrees with this in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 through 12. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things, which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. The prophets did not understand these things, he says, and the angels did not understand them either, even though they wanted to. Well, now they are in luck, says St. Paul. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now, unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal promise which he purposed in Jesus Christ our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 8 through 12. Not only the church, but the angels in heaven are learning about the plan of God for the world in Christ from what was revealed to St. Paul and the inspiration by the Holy Ghost that is given to other faithful men to interpret and expound upon. No, our teaching is not inerrant, as are the scriptures themselves, but it is inspired to make the truth of the scriptures known to you, and that is what we are going to do, God permitting. With this foundation having been laid, I cite you now the passage in question. It is from the King James Version, and it, along with the Dewey Reams Catholic Scriptures, are the only authorized Bibles in the English language. I am not going to get diverted off onto that discussion just now, but I will tell you this in all sincerity and truth. If you really want to know what the Bible says... Get rid of that commercialized, secularized, compromised book and get a King James Bible. It is the only way you are really going to know. Our passage is Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks, and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublous times." And after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined, shall be poured upon the desolate. Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, being an Old Testament scripture, is not all important. Even so, being a prophecy about the coming of the Messiah, it was very important to the nation, and, as it turns out, it is to the world at large as well. When the Pharisees sent people out to John the Baptist, it was to see if this prophecy was taking place. The disciples understood what was happening. They confessed among themselves, we have found the promised Messiah. 
In order to establish the truth of this passage as it relates to St. Luke chapter 3, verse 23, and the earthly ministry of the incarnate God, I am going to go through this passage and definitively explain the meaning of each part. This is made necessary by the torturing of this passage that has taken place by Christian Zionism. To begin, what was the purpose of this prophecy? Verse 24 answers that question. It was to establish the exact time of the coming of the Messiah, the Prince. How many princes are identified by name and title in these four verses? If you want to do something in preparation for the continuation of this study, go back and read this passage over and over again with the purpose in mind of answering this question. We will talk about that a bit more the next time. Right now, I want to follow along with the thought of the purpose for this prophecy. It was to identify God's program for this specified time, which is identified as 70 weeks. It was to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and the prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. This is the program of God about which the prophet is speaking. It is all work that will be done by God as, with, and through the Messiah Prince. That is what this passage goes on to say. Do not forget the purpose for the coming of the Messiah Prince as laid out by these verses as we pursue this study. Read more at GodsPointOfView.com. A copy of this book is available from Amazon in Kindle and paperback format. Link in the description.